welcome back everybody, uh, or welcome afresh if this is the first time that you are joining us. It's time for our solution session. This is the time of the day where we do a deep dive on a particular topic. The topic in this instance, it's the future of broadcast, the impact of the gap in sports programming. Somewhere deep in the perspective, I have my colleague David Cushman. Standing in the shadow of uh, Westminster and the Houses of Parliament here in London, uh, we're going to join our uh, fantastic guests who are going to be in conversation over the next 20 25 minutes or so. Uh, we'll encourage your questions as always. Uh, please add those to the, um, the live chat and we'll ask a few of those uh, later. But delighted to be joined uh, by Doug Perlman, uh, the CEO of Sports Media Advisors, and our old friend uh, Dave Nugent uh, from ix.com. Co, Chief Commercial Officer, their friend of leaders. Uh, Dave, uh, different type of leaders event, but great to see you. And uh, first of all, how are you? Uh, fantastic. Thanks so much for having us. Good stuff. Um, I know you've got plenty of questions uh, to get into, plenty of topics to discuss uh, with Doug. So for the moment, we'll leave the floor to you. Great. Uh, so Doug, good to actually see your face. It's been a little while. Likewise, uh, how, likewise. How, how are you? How are you doing? How, how are Lisa and the boys? Uh, I guess it's all things considered, which is how everybody seems to start to answer that question. Everybody's doing all right. Everybody's healthy. So we're thankful for that. We're uh, I'm working out of my house in Connecticut here with uh, three teenage boys who are finishing up their year in high school, including a high school senior who's having a bit of a tough time. But all things considered, we're doing all right. And you guys are doing well? Uh, we're well, exactly the same thing. I'm actually pleased, and, and those who are watching, hopefully they're experiencing this the same way. I'm pleased with how well my kids have adapted to this, all things considered. Uh, Doug, the best place to start probably is maybe give a little bit of background on SMA and what you guys do so we can dive into some more specific questions. Yeah, sure. So SMA is a, a firm I started a little over 10 years ago, Sports Media Advisors, and uh, as the name would suggest, we do all sorts of advisory work in and around the sports media space. And I think I generally would break it down into sort of three buckets. The first is we advise lots of sports properties on their media businesses. So we've worked with most of the major leagues and a lot of other properties, uh, working on a lot of uh, strategic engagements, helping them think through where the media world is headed and the implications for them. And we'll also help them negotiate their primary, uh, primary media contracts. Uh, the second thing we do is help businesses like your own to uh, grow sports related businesses, help them with sort of go to market strategies and uh, getting in front of the right folks with the right message and striking the right kinds of deals. And the third thing we do is we work with a lot of investors in the space who are, you know, looking to invest in properties or media or technology companies who are hoping to get a better understanding of where the media world is headed and the implications for them. That's great. That, that, that's helpful background. So with that as a backdrop, then. I'm going to dive right into, uh, uh, I think, some topics that many people are asking about and, and talking about on Zoom calls and, and things like that. So, so can you talk a little bit about how contracts address the non-playing of games? How, how, how are things like that being managed? Sure. This is coming up with a lot of clients, and it's a question I get from a lot of people. Um, and in classic uh, consultant fashion, my first answer will be, it depends. Right? So, it, you know, it really is based on the language and the contracts between the media companies and the properties. I would say, you know, at the highest level, the, the sort of the, the primary notion is, you know, if games aren't played, ultimately the property will not get paid. Uh, but it's far more complex than that. Uh, in some cases, it, it, I guess it is quite as simple as that. If, if, if an event doesn't happen, uh, the property isn't paid. But a lot of times there'll be provisions where the media company will make some payments to the property while things sort of play themselves out. So we have a client, for example, uh, where if their event doesn't take place this year, they'll get paid in full, and then they'll need to pay back uh, that right to you over the next five years in an interest-free loan. Uh, we have other clients, and I know this is the case, a number of sort of significant properties where the rights fees are paid while you try to sort of work through, can we reschedule, can the media company accommodate those windows, et cetera. And those kind of provisions were really based on the premise that if an event didn't happen, the property would be probably suffering more deeply than the media company would because the media company had a more diverse business and less likely it was less, less likely to have cash flows under that scenario. So there's a really wide range of uh, 
ways that that's addressed. And of course it differs if an event is canceled entirely versus if it's stopped in mid season, like the NBA and the NHL. And when it is stopped in mid season, uh, there's often provisions about uh, how you treat the rights fee. Do you look at it on a pro rata basis? How do you value the playoffs versus regular season? Cause so much of the value is there. So as I said, on the one hand, the answer is very simple, but as you delve into it, as with so many other things, it's, it can get pretty complicated. And I will say, and I think this is a great thing about the industry in which we all work. Um, at the end of the day, people kind of want to figure these things out as partners. So there's the contractual language, but at the end of the day, people want to figure things out in a way that will you know, work uh, for what most folks like to think of as long-term partnerships and relationships. So um, this is maybe a good place to dive into. Are, are there actually deals getting done right now? Do you need to hit the pause button on the nature of uh, negotiations when it comes to a lot of, you know, a lot of sports properties, rights holders are going to be coming out of deals in the next year or so. Can you do deals now? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, of course, these are, these are strange and difficult times and, 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 and COVID is kind of uh, always in the background, but deals are being done right now. We uh, are working on behalf of a significant client. And just before everything really hit, we had reached, had sort of a handshake on the rights fee, but had a lot of other things to figure out. And we're continuing to negotiate that deal in earnest right now. So that's a negotiation, again, uh, that we're involved with. Um, and my strong sense is that there are a number of others going on, including with some real significant properties. And I think that's because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the media companies recognize that as we emerge from this, sports is going to be uh, an incredibly important part of their business and remain incredibly valuable, valuable to them. So, you know, as you know, it's the content about which people are most passionate. It's the last thing people watch live on a relative basis. It's getting more and more powerful than ever. So I think the media companies recognize that, you know, we will emerge from this and that sports is going to be incredibly important to them. And so those conversations uh, are, are, are continuing. Great. Um, so we, we, we all follow the nature of these deals. Some of us track uh, the, the rights windows for, for our businesses. Um, I, I was particularly intrigued by the SEC deal uh, when Disney stepped in and took that property over specific to the increase. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. We, um, you know, we were not involved in that deal. So I'm just going on, you know, press reports, but my uh, uh, strong sense is one, I think the industry recognized that the, the prior deal, the SEC's deal with CBS was materially undervalued. So, uh, you know, the SEC was was due for a material increase. And then I think when you look at it, you know, that property in ESPN's hands uh, is particularly valuable because of all the levers that they have to really um, to really drive value from it. They have the other SEC package. So in terms of scheduling and windows, that makes life a lot easier. They have the SEC network. So I think uh, I think everyone expected the SEC to get a big bump, and then it was I think uh, an even bigger number was driven by the fact that in ESPN's hands, those rights are incredibly valuable. Yeah, and you, you sort of touched on this, but this has always been a, a really interesting topic to me. The the different rights are actually valued by and and um, are different to different uh, uh, broadcast media companies. Is that right? May, maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that's that's definitely right, and that's become increasingly true in our business. So, you know, when we are entering a a, uh, a rights negotiation, the first thing we'll do, as any property would, is you know build a model to try to make a case for the value of those rights. And over the time that we've been in business, that's become an increasingly complex exercise because the entities with whom we're speaking all have different businesses. Like there was a time. Um, well, there was a time before you, you and I were doing this when it was just broadcast networks and their business was advertising and that lent itself to one model. And then as we got into the business, you, know, you had to look at cable networks too and the dual revenue streams of subscription revenue, et cetera. And now it's become more complex because folks that you may bring these rights to really are in different businesses. So, you know, if you're, if you're talking to a, a sports cable network on one hand, but then also to an Amazon, for example, on the other they're in a different business. They have different levers. They have different ways to monetize the rights. So you've really got to try to think about what the rights uh, are worth in the hands of very different businesses. Uh, so it's more challenging, but also very exciting uh, for properties to think about the opportunities that they can have working with all sorts of different people. 
Yeah, and and that even extends to the to the internal culture and people inside the organization, right? I think I mentioned to you that we were working with uh, a, a large brand who was a big sponsor of a large uh, motorsports property, and it turns out a primary driver for that was the personal interests of the executives inside of the company that had a that had a, a, a big influence on on their desire to be involved. Do you, do you see that as well? We do, we do, and it you know, and it's 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 definitely a fact of the industry that uh, you know when when individuals change within different organizations, the appetite for certain types of properties will change, whether it's uh, because of a personal interest or just different uh, executives who have different visions for where growth opportunities are, et cetera. So, you know, it's funny sometimes when people say, you know, well, what are these rights worth or that's right, are those rights worth? That never lends itself to a short answer, right? There are so many variables at play that can impact the value of rights uh, once you enter a negotiation. And one of those things is, uh, is, you know, who are the executives that are making the decisions? Yeah, yeah. What are, what are properties talking to you guys about now? What are the, what are the, uh, other than, Hey, we got to get back to work. What are, what are the topics that, that they're touching? Right. Uh, well, the first you touched on is certainly, you know, how do we think about coming back? That's not really our area of expertise other than as it relates to their media contracts and the ability to find new windows, et cetera. Uh, but we're certainly participating in some of those conversations in terms of when to come back, how to come back, where to come back. Um, and then the other thing that we're spending a lot of time talking to folks about is how to remain engaged with their fans. You know, you know that better than anyone. That's such a critical thing right now, whether it's how to optimize their social media opportunities uh, to the extent that these outlets have cable networks or OTT platforms that they can leverage. Uh, we're spending a lot of time with folks who are trying to be real creative and make sure their fans uh, remain engaged during this time. And I mean, I'm sure you're seeing a ton of that as well. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this comes down to the importance of, especially when you're a, a, a sports property or rights holder in charge of the health of the sport, you need to be able to have that direct conversation with fans in real time. Um, and when you don't have, you know, what was the traditional uh, marketing channel for, for many sports pro uh, uh, properties being broadcast, uh, digital becomes obviously even, even more important. Um, so we'd see that as well. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, this is a hard one. When do you see people coming back? Obviously, we just came out, came through a, a weekend where Bundesliga, NASCAR, we had the Skins game. Um, it's starting, right? Um, in in sports where, at least in North America, sports where it's a little bit easier to socially distance. Um, when? How do you see this process unfolding? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the the obvious answer is is nobody knows, right? I mean, I think the virus is ultimately going to dictate the answer to that question. But, you know, like anybody in the industry or even like a lot of fans, we're spending a lot of time thinking and talking about that. Uh, first, you know, as you said, I would say we were sort of really excited to see how this weekend played out. You know, I knock on wood when I say this, but it seems like um, NASCAR and the Skins game and Bundesliga really, you know, went off without a hitch. I was really impressed with what they were able to do in terms of all the safety protocols, et cetera. Uh, so I think that's a great sign. Uh, and I think kind of where we go from here is ultimately it will be dictated by the virus. You know, I think, you know, league commissioners and conference commissioners, and I don't, I don't think they know the answer. So I certainly don't, but I will say, you know, it, it, you know, my best guess is, um, you know, it'll come back in sort of phases, right? So you'll see, uh, you'll see, uh, events with no fans and then you'll probably see events with distance fans, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, I am an optimist by nature. And even this morning, there was some good news about uh, some developments with respect to vaccines, et cetera. I think once you get back some combination of vaccines and treatment, the world will return uh, to something that looks a little, looks a lot like it used to. I don't know that it'll ever look exactly the same. I think people will be more cognizant of certain issues and there'll be protections in place. And that's a good thing, whether COVID is under control or not. Uh, but I, but I do think that we're going to get, we're going to get back there. And, and your sense is, and obviously we're, we're all reading, I think, similar things. Your sense is that, you know, coming back with no fans the way NASCAR or the PGA Tour and Bundesliga did this this weekend, that seems to to be a trend. Again, I'm not asking you pr to predict the path of the virus. I know that's very difficult. Uh, but but generally speaking, you know, there's an impact also on sports that are purely gate driven, obviously. Right. So 
Uh, but but you see, that's the way it, it it'll it'll probably unfold. I do, I do. I think that only makes sense to you know do things without fans. You know, I, I'm intrigued by the way that different folks are approaching that the challenge that presents, whether it's putting you know uh, images of fans in the background, and in certain countries they're allowing fans to pay for their face to be placed on the on the uh, on, on on the uh, fake fans, if you will, and you know the money for that is going to charity, which I, which I think is great. Uh, I've seen other folks talking about using, you know, CGI to to uh, make it appear as though fans are there, and everybody's having a debate about whether you pump in fan noise or not, and whether that's like a cheesy laugh track from an old sitcom or actually creates the environment. Uh, so it raises a lot of real interesting production challenges. And again, I thought what I saw this weekend looked great. Um, and it's really, I think, part of what we're going to see when you ask about how things are going to roll back. It's, it's certainly going to be different for different sports and different for different parts of the country. Uh, given again the nature of the sports, the nature of the different uh, areas, etc. Um, so I think uh, you know I think that's all going to be part of the mix. Uh, something that is top of mind for a lot of folks, especially folks like you who have a, a senior in high school expecting to go to his first semester of college. The impact on college sports here is obviously huge. Um, can you talk a little bit about the way you see that unfolding? Yeah, sure. That's that's a question we get a lot. And it's, again, something I know a lot of folks talking about. I, I, I actually think that's a, it's a bit of an underreported story, although you're seeing more and more in the news about it. I think college, you know, comes with its own unique set of challenges because uh, there's no single person in charge. Right. I mean, if you look at the NFL, Roger Goodell is ultimately going to make the decision along with the 32 owners. And, you know, you can get all of them in one room. And I'm not saying it's easy by any stretch, but it's a there's a decision making structure in place. I think, you know, in college, you have so many different voices, so many different decision makers, so many different perspectives. Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. You have the debate about whether athletes can participate in sports, even if the students aren't back and quote, aren't back can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. Uh, you know, you know, you have different conferences that may view things differently, different States that will view things differently conferences with schools across all of those States. Uh, so I think it's going to be really interesting. And as we all know, football drives college athletics. So if there is no football, I think you'll see, uh, that there won't be a lot of other sports as well. That it's already started to happen. As you saw, I think Cincinnati was the first program to go out there and say they had to drop men's soccer due to some of the economic harm they were anticipating. I think you're going to see that play out time and again, uh, you know, across the sports landscape if sports isn't played uh in a way in, in sort of the normal fashion um and then to touch on another point you made you know in terms of the in everybody wants to get back and get that media revenue uh but then uh different sports are also impacted based on the extent to which they rely on the gate right of course uh, you know you look at the nhl is a little is, is more gate driven than the nfl for example or you know i saw in minor league baseball is really all about the gate you know i think they've said you know, if, if there's no fans and stands, there's no point in playing the game. So uh, it's a bit of a long winded answer, but there are so many variables at play from the, again, the nature of the sport to the extent to which they're gate driven to where they play and what their leadership structure is. It's, it's, it's going to be uh, fascinating. And the nature of, as you mentioned, a lot of most other sports, aside from American football, basketball to a lesser extent, um, are funded by those those sports, right? So there, there is a possibility where if those things have to be scaled back or cut for a season, where that has a downstream impact on a bunch of athletes who have been training their entire life to go to school and swim or do gymnastics or, or whatever, right? Yeah, no, I really feel for those kids. And as you say, you know, my son is sort of, you know, of the age where he's got a lot of friends uh, that could really be impacted by all of this. So uh, I think, it, you know, the vast majority of schools, football, is the primary driver of revenues. Men's and women's basketball can can be profitable and drive revenues. And then they really tend to support all these other sports. So if those dollars aren't there, sports are going to get cut and you're going to have kids who chose school, you know, X, Y, or Z because they wanted to go there and play for a particular coach or be part of a particular program. And now they're being told that program is gone. And, um, you know, of course, you know, those kinds of stories pale in comparison to what's happening in the world today. But boy, I really feel for those kids. You know, I think that's really tough. But maybe on a, on, a, on a related note, you know, there are entire ecosystems that you know many of the large college towns in the, in the United States are 
focus purely on the economies uh, that exist around those schools. And in many cases, the basketball and football programs that exist there. So there's a downstream impact on the, on the economy in a huge way in those places. Right. For sure. I mean, I, I, you know, I have tremendous faith in college commissioners. Again, we're focusing on college right now, you know, to make the right decisions for the health and welfare of their students and their fans and their communities. But boy, they've got to be feeling a ton of pressure to get back and play. Because as you say, it's not just the university. In some, in, in, in many instances, uh, there are towns that are just incredibly reliant on the business that those big games bring into those towns on college football Saturdays. Uh, again, you know, so you know that creates a lot of lot of pressure uh, to get back yeah. and play. Yeah. So uh, now here, here's the hard one. We get we're getting asked this now. We're doing workshops on the new normal, right? W- w- what's the world going to look like? Uh, at a macro level, then also, you know, how, how are simple things going to be done when we uh, eventually try to uh, return to normal, whether it's attending games or the way broadcasts will be impacted? Um, maybe talk about that a little bit from your perspective. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but. Yeah, sure. No, I'll do my best. I mean, I think, um, you know, as I, as I alluded to earlier, I, I, I think, I think we're, we're going to, this will go in phases. Uh, and I think again, in the short term, you're going to see, the events that are able to come back without fans. Uh, and then I think over time fans will be allowed back, but in a sort of in a distanced way. So the seating arrangements will be different. Uh, the way that they arrive at, at the arenas will be different. Well, they'll be given times to arrive, et cetera. You know, people are talking about things like temperature checks, et cetera, although we all know that's not foolproof, but of course it helps. Uh, the way you, uh, either there'll be no concessions or touchless concessions, et cetera. So I think it's going to sort of uh, there'll be phases uh, as folks as folks come back, and then again, I'm an optimist by nature. I do think that as uh, as we get vaccines and treatments, I think it will start to look a lot more like it did prior to COVID. Although again, people will be more cognizant of certain things, and as, as I said, that's probably probably a good thing. So I do think we'll be back, and I think you know if you raise it to sort of its highest level of generality, I'm 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 certain that all the things that have sustained this industry are there now and will continue to manifest itself in whatever the business looks like. The passion will be there. The interest will be there. The desire of fans to engage, whether live or via media will be there. So those sort of are really the underpinnings of the businesses that we're all in and that's not going anywhere. And so it might look a little different. It might take a little time till it looks less different, but I'm quite certain that, you know, none of that is going to change. Yeah. And I guess maybe along the, the lines of, uh, n- what a new normal is. Um, you've got to be thinking about uh, the the behavior relative to like not, we all went through, or many of most of us went through nine eleven. Like, what is what does that new normal look like? And will there be certain things that are just going to need to be accepted the way we take our shoes off in an airport now? Right, right. You know, it's you know the uh, you know, humans have the, the the capacity to adapt, right? And so, you know, it, it, it's, you know, after 9-11, I think a lot of us, want, you know, wondered, would we ever get back to life as normal? Would people ever want to be in New York City? Would people ever want to congregate at stadiums or arenas? You know, as they seemed like a target, was that going to be an area that people had to be concerned about, et cetera? And of course, um, adjustments were made, as you said, you know, the metal detectors, the shoes off at the airport, et cetera. But things came back uh, in ways large and small, and certainly sports came back uh and you know with as, as strong as ever and i am hopeful that this will be much like that and that there will maybe some adaptions uh that we'll have to make some changes that will be have to have to be made but i'm hopeful that uh and you know i don't know i don't know if it's next year or two years from now that we'll be having a conversation talking about you know the incredible resurgence of the sports industry and looking back and saying remember people were nervous about whether sports would come back well look how strong they've come yeah, that, that's a. This is a, a topic that we're being asked about a lot, obviously, and we've got clients who are interested in everything from, well, what do we do when there's no crowd noise, right? When when Ricky Fowler hits a an eagle putt and no one yeah. cheers, which happened this weekend. Yeah, um, it's stra- it's strange for the athlete too, right? Like I saw that in Bundesliga games as well. For sure, for sure, yeah, and. Uh, you know, I've seen some of the athletes saying, you know, it's been a long time since they've since they've played a game without a large crowd, right? Uh, yeah. And again, and, and that even that varies from sport to sport, right? So I think uh, maybe a lot of you know basketball players, for example, 
uh, who have been in the spotlight since they were quite young and then through college and then into the NBA. You know, they've been used to playing in front of crowds since they were quite young or they were the high school star that everybody had to see and the high school gyms were packed. But I also saw a baseball player recently saying, you know, uh, I had to make my way through the minor leagues. And then there were, there were plenty of times when the crowd was pretty sparse. So, yeah. you know, I think I'll be able to adjust. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, I guess it'll be about, you know, we're all adjusting, right? On the, sort of on the business side of the media realm, there's tons of issues to be considered. On the production side, I've been so impressed with the creativity of the folks uh, that have gotten events on the air thus far and some of the things that I'm hearing them talk about. And then, of course, the athletes and the coaches, et cetera, are all going to have to adjust to playing in a, in a different environment, at least for a while. Yeah, it's funny. I noticed watching uh, one of the Bundesliga matches this weekend, I know. I noticed even a muted on, on the goal being scored, you know, typically there's a pile, right? And there right. was sort of like a half high five, half sort of chest bump. They, it seemed like nobody was really sure what they were. They were all excited. And then they all kind of, you know, took a step backwards. Is yeah, pretty funny. Yeah. Your instincts take over and then you have to sort of catch yourself, right? It's uh, And it's funny. I mean, it's sort of a perfect example of how quickly people adapt, right? Like I remember in the early days, just a couple months ago, uh, actually going to a leader's uh, think tank event. And it was a time when everybody was saying, you, should, you know, you shouldn't be shaking hands. And I just couldn't help myself. And I shook everybody's hand and then I caught myself, you know, but but now I'm not, right? And, you know, right. you sort of adjust. And obviously as things wait in, you get used to a different routine. And, um, you know, the athletes will too, and the celebrations will look different. So, yeah. Uh, well, listen, Doug, this, is, this, is, this has been great. I know that uh, we were asked to leave some time for, uh, questions. Um, I think those are going to come to us from David. Is that right? Dave, uh, and thank you to uh, Doug. Fascinating conversation. Um, question uh, from Gerald Powell from uh, Nielsen Sports, um, who asks, um, how do you view, I suppose this is for both of you, but how do you view the value of fixtures behind closed doors? Is the demand for live content sufficient to compensate for any reduction in viewing experience? I'll let you go first, Doug, and I'll give you my perspective on that. Sure, I think so. If I'm, if I understand the question right, and you pl please let me know if you think I misunderstood it. I think the question is, will there still be significant value to sporting events if there are no crowds there? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. I think certainly, especially that's the case now, where you know people are just starved for live content and for competition. So I think people will turn in. Uh, you know, regardless of whether there are there are crowds there. Uh, I think, you know, over time, people might get more and more frustrated. But I also think over time, you know, the folks uh, that are overseeing production at the various media outlets will come up with ways to uh, enhance the experience and make sure fans uh, engage and have and, and have that quality experience. And I guess the last thing I'll say, I know we've kind of touched on this in a number of different ways in the course of this conversation. It'll vary from sport to sport. Like I, I thought NASCAR uh, was a great viewing experience yesterday, even without uh, fans in the audience. I think other sports uh, where the fans are sort of more on top of the action, like basketball, for example, uh, may seem a little bit stranger if there's a, you know, a buzzer beater and no fans in the audience that might have a different feel. Uh, but largely, I think, uh, I think we'd all be thrilled to be able to watch our favorite sports even without fans in the audience. Yeah, I think that's 100 percent right. I think there's a there's an advantage to being just based on the time of the year to being first back too, right? You you got access to audiences that are clamoring for this content, and you know I know that that NASCAR saw some great numbers even when it was i racing before it was officially back, and now uh, I know the numbers this weekend were were really great, and and I think there are advantages to to that beyond uh, fans fans and stands, as we say. As a, as a follow up to that, uh, Dave, another question uh, has come in to us um, about whether some sports have an advantage in terms of returning to live events first. We've obviously seen a few individual competitions, but I wonder if either of you would point to any specific sports that you think are in good shape here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think some of the sports that you saw this weekend sort of suggest the answer to that question. I think, you know, NASCAR, again, the the competitors are, you know, in cars, behind protective equipment, et cetera. Um, I think that really helped them to come back. And by the way, it was a massive undertaking with that took tons of effort to create the protocol to protect the drivers and everybody else that was at the event. Uh, but I think, again, the nature of the sport 
uh, made it possible for them to come back. I think golf, again, you can play in a socially distanced way. Um, uh, soccer will be interesting. You know, my instincts are that it's not as clear to me that that uh, lends itself to the same type of comfort level, but Bundesliga is back and all seems to be going well, so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, I'm hopeful that tennis uh, is another example of, of an event where you'll be able to play and be comfortably social distance. And I know uh, folks have talked about, uh, you know, events where each player serves with different sets of balls. So you're not even touching the same tennis ball that your competitor did. And obviously, you know, you'd sit on either side of the, of the net. And when you change sides, you pass on each side of the net. So I think that there are certainly ways to do that. So there's no question certain sports lend themselves better to others. And there are others that are more contact sports uh, where you're sort of breathing heavily on your competitor who's right there over an extended period of time. And I think that'll probably make uh, people more nervous. And then, and there's other variables as well, including whether the sports are played indoors or outdoors. So, um, I mean, there's no question that there's sort of a spectrum of, of high risk, medium risk, low risk, um, if that makes sense. But, but look, at the end of the day, there, there are still these are still large groups of people that need to assemble to put these events on. Right there. Yeah. Most people don't even realize NASCAR requires 800 plus people to put a race on with nobody in the stands. And that was and these were our reduced groups uh, from a team's perspective, too. Um, and, you know, when you, you talk about an NFL football team, 52 plus players, plus coaches, trainers, they are big, big groups of people, even without the fans in the stands. It's, it's complicated. So different sports uh, have different paths ahead of them there. What about the digital platforms that you've been um, watching these sports engage on over the last few weeks? Um, and as a, a, a sort of a defined question from Moafak al uh from al Ittihad, um, he asks, what is the next digital sports platform that we should be watching for? Uh, that is a that's a great question, and I, I I wish I had a crystal ball and could tell you exactly what that digital platform is. I, w here's what I can tell you, and Doug will weigh in on this as well. Uh, video content is obviously the driver because of live sports. Video content is the most important content for sports uh, properties for media companies as well. Uh, the, a, a vast majority of the conversation that goes on uh, around sports is takes place on social platforms. It is not easy for sports properties and media companies to monetize that content. So uh, getting some of those eyeballs or, or majority of those eyeballs back to owned and operated technology uh, becomes an important challenge. Um, there, I, I believe that one of the things that comes out of this window uh, in the new normal scenario is uh, are going to be advancements in technology that would not have otherwise had to take place. You know, we. We typically are very innovative during uh, windows like this. Um, exactly what is that platform? I mean, if you talk to my kids, uh, they'll, they'll tell you that they have a perspective on what it is today. It, it, it changes every six to 12 months. Uh, Doug, I don't know if, you would, if you'd add something to that. Yeah, no, I, no, I completely agree. I mean, I think one, and at, at, at again, a real high level of generality, times like these tend to accelerate change and tend to accelerate innovation. So I think we'll see all sorts of new uh, things emerge from this that that will allow fans to engage with their favorite sports and athletes, et cetera. Um, and I think the notion that you addressed, Dave, is 100% right. We, we think about that all the time on behalf of our clients in terms of, you know, social is so critically important to engaging with your fans and growing in their business. And the phrase we've all used so many times of putting your content where the fans already are makes a ton of sense and always does. By the same token, it can be harder to monetize uh, your rights on third-party platforms. So how do you strike a balance between your owned and operated platforms versus third-party platforms? Uh, and I think that will um, sort of the the platforms that allow properties to strike that balance most effectively will put themselves in a really good place. And, and I think that that question was really around the consumption of sports more than anything else. But from a technology standpoint, you know, things like contact tracing, the ability to monitor where people are during a window of time like this becomes really important. There, there, there are going to be ecosystems that spring up around uh, the sports landscape in order to facilitate safety, right? So there, there, there's going to be a lot of that, which is on top of the things that many of us work on in real time, which is the fan engagement part of it, right? How do, how do we distribute content in real time and make sure that fans are getting what they need? Question from uh, Sven Jonker, who works for uh, the Astana World Tour 
uh, professional cycling team. Big broad question this, but he talks specifically about a cycling example. Is this the moment to divide media rights revenue in a different way than we've become accustomed to? And he talks about professional cycling where there are lots of teams um, in financial difficulties, uh, finding it tough, um, but the race organizers are the ones who own the vast majority of the, the rights. Obviously different for each sport, but maybe you can expand a little and, and give a sense of where you think we're heading to in terms of those sort of models. Doug, this is you more than me. You, you, you should tackle this. <laughs> sure. It's, I mean, that, it's, that, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I mean, I think, you know, my instinct is that what's happening today is probably not going to lead to a fundamental shift in how dollars are divided or how deals are structured or rights are controlled. Um, I don't think that will be driven by everything that, that, that COVID has led us to. Um, having said that, I think um, two things. One, obviously, there, there have to be discussions uh within the ecosystems of various sports in order to figure out how to come out of them so for example you know everyone's reading about what's happening in baseball and the need for the league and the and the players association to agree on an approach to coming back in july um so those are sort of short-term things that need to be figured out um and that's an example where you know people are going to have to be cr creative and carve up the pie maybe differently or approach the carving up of the pie a little differently. But I don't view that as a long-term change to the way that, um, that you know, rights or revenues are addressed. And I guess the only other thing I'd say is to the extent that there's a sport that was uh, suffering from a challenged model before, the issues that COVID has been risen to may again accelerate the pace of change and may lead folks to be more open to different paradigms and different structures. So you may see that, uh, but I don't think, you know, COVID and all of the challenges it's given rise to in and of itself will change the way that, again, sports are structured or rights or revenues are divided. Uh, we've got a, a few minutes left. So if I may take the liberty of crowdsourcing from you two experts a question for myself. We've got um, Marie Donahue coming up on the show a little bit later on uh, in the week. Um, Marie, the, the head of global live sports for Amazon. General question for both of you, um, just, just uh, you know, up front. What excites you and or puzzles you about the way that Amazon has been getting into sport? Um, and what should I ask Marie when she comes on the show? Doug, you start, I'll, I'll, I'll follow. <laughs> uh, well, Marie has been a friend for many, many years. I, I think the world of her, and I think she's doing a great job at Amazon. Uh, you know, I'm really excited about what they're doing there. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, taking a step back for a second, I think oftentimes people in, in sessions like this or elsewhere will say, you know, what's the future of digital bidders? And they're, you know, coming into the sports landscape and buying up material rights. And I'll often say it's a mistake to think of the digital bidders as a monolith, right? As we touched on earlier, each of them have very different businesses, different motivations, different abilities, different cultures, et cetera. Uh, and so we think of each of them differently as we try to think about the right partners for our sports property clients, et cetera. And I've said in a variety of forum that I'm incredibly bullish on the role that Amazon is gonna play in the sports realm. Uh, I think they have a culture uh, that uh, is comfortable with the types of uh, strategic spending that sports deals often entail. Uh, I think they have a lot of levers and ways to drive revenue from rights that they might secure, whether it's from obviously driving e-commerce or monetizing the data they're able to collect through fans, et cetera. Um, so I'm very excited about the role that Amazon is, has, is, is playing landscape and will continue to play. Um, you know, we've seen what they've done here. We've seen what they've done in the UK and elsewhere. And, you know, I was thrilled to read that when they showed their Premier League matches, they had the most signups for Prime that they'd ever had. So it sort of proved the notion that um, sports rights will help platforms like Amazon, you know, acquire and retain uh, consumers. So that dynamic and that principle is so incredibly important uh, to sports properties who are trying to convey the value of their rights. So. I'm really excited about what Marie and Amazon are doing in the sports realm, and, and I look for, for them to do more 
uh, and for them to benefit and for the properties to benefit. And Amazon is um, obviously a multifaceted business, right? They're in the content business, but they're also selling me and my family pretty much everything we buy in real time. And and as Doug said, you know, where many of these rights are driven by the ability to put the right ads in front of the right people in real time, uh, Amazon can surround my screen with the stuff that they know that I just looked at and can convert on uh, in addition to the potential for advertising and getting uh, new prime subscriptions. So it's, it's a, they have deep pockets and it's a very powerful model. Just, and, and I guess in terms of a question that, that you could ask her and I'll be sure to watch is um, uh, how they go about thinking about the value of sports properties uh, when they're considering bidding on one. So, um, you know, again, if you're a, if you're a ca sports cable network, uh, it's largely about ad revenue and subscriber revenue and, also, uh, of course, there's also the strategic value that some sports properties can bring to a media company in terms of, you know, lifting your broader schedule, et cetera, et cetera. But it'd be interesting to hear from Rhea a little bit and, uh, you know, without giving away any secrets, how they go about thinking about the value of properties and why some properties interest them more than most and where they see the value that they can derive. We've just got a, a couple of minutes uh, left. Uh, maybe a, a final question, and again, apologies, it's a, a big, broad one, but um, we've been touching on various um, new uh, streaming platforms, Prime Video uh, amongst them on new-ish, and obviously, uh, certainly over there with you in the US, the so-called streaming wars are well underway. Um, so much coverage, so much hype around a lot of these new uh, services that are being launched, uh, inside sport and outside sport. What, what should uh, sports leagues, sports teams, investors in sport be looking for um, as they try and work their way through the acres of coverage we've seen around all these new services? And what are you looking out for as, as um, important in all of this uh, as it becomes the, the new reality? Do you mean that within the context of rights specifically? Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. But but if there's anything broader than that, any sort of hints or tips as to what uh, our, our rights holder audience should be should be keeping an eye on. I, I'll go very quickly. This is again, this is a little bit more Doug's sweet spot. But um, I think it's important the, the the comment that Doug made about these are not monoliths, right? Like the, all of these businesses operate differently, even though they are on the surface uh, in um, you know the, the streaming giants. Um, they, they have different models, they, they're building their businesses out in different ways. Um, and, and it's not just the streaming giants who are competing for a lot of this, uh, for, for this content. So um, I, again, maybe just to emphasize that, that would be my short term response. Yeah, and I, I agree with that certainly. And, and I would say a couple of things quickly. One, um, to Dave's point, people tend to, to, to bunch these streaming companies into sort of one bucket and we always think of them as, as, as in slightly different buckets, if you will. One is um, the streaming businesses that are being launched by the incumbent large media companies, ESPN Plus and NBC Sports Gold and CBS All Access and Bleacher Report Live. That's sort of one version of direct-to-consumer uh, streaming entities. Uh, then you have sort of the, we would call sort of the pure play streaming companies like DAZN. Uh, without an incumbent media business. And then you also have, again, sort of the digital players, the Amazons and Facebooks and Twitters of the world. Um, so again, these are, those are all very different businesses. Uh, but I think, again, at a high level, if, in terms of the way properties should be thinking about them, um, I think one of the biggest elements that comes into play in virtually every media rights negotiation we do is the balance of revenue and exposure. Uh, and so as you go about looking to license your rights to third parties, I think, uh, you know, most of the, the uh, strategies we've developed and negotiations will execute are, are now contemplating those streaming entities. And as we speak to them and think about them and look to talk to them, uh, of course, everybody's focused on maximizing their rights fee, but you also want to focus on what it will do for the exposure for your property. Uh, because you don't want to take the short-term dollar. You need to think about long-term how exposure and the audience you can garner will drive all of your businesses. So I think at a real high level, that's something that you're going to, you're going to want to look at. And again, all those different entities have different answers to those questions. Um, and But I think that's a dynamic that's going to be real important as people start to think about uh, how these streaming entities play a bigger and bigger part of the sports media rights landscape. 
Well, it's an absolutely fascinating conversation and it's one that will uh, run on and on. Uh, real pleasure to have you uh, both with us. Uh, Doug Perlman, CEO at Sports Media Advisors and Dave Nugent, Chief Commercial Officer at ix.co. Thank you, gentlemen.